thank you for the opportunity. Uh, as Fabrice mentioned, I will be talking about the early signatures of auditory temporal processing and more precisely rhythm processing in premature neonates using uh, EEG, high resolution EEG. First, because we will be using this term a lot during the presentation, uh, what is the definition of rhythm? By rhythm, uh, we are referring to the temporal uh, relationship, relative temporal relationship between the auditory events and auditory intervals. If you look at the image presented on, on the slide, uh, we see three measures and uh, we see the notes presented, but um, below you see the uh, relative duration of each note with respect to the quarter note, which is the note coming at the beginning. So we can define the temporal relation, the temporal duration of each event with respect to to a simple beat, which is the quarter beat, quarter note here. But uh, how is rhythm created? Rhythm, uh, rhythm is created and perceived by temporal regularities between auditory events. If uh, we look at the tree. Uh, here we see that the temporal regularities exist at different levels and uh, we see that we have in fact a hierarchy of temporal regularities creating temporal relationship between the auditory events. When we talk about rhythm, the first thing that comes to mind is musical rhythm, but in fact rhythm is not a characteristic limited to music and we can have it, for example, in other domains such as language in the prosody of language. So the knowledge and the, uh, the studies on rhythm perception can be generalized to other domains, including language studies. When, uh, when we listen to a rhythm, a rhythmic pattern, uh, the, the temporal regularities allow us to group the auditory events together and uh, also to recognize the structure of, 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 of sound of the auditory event. Uh, there is a huge body of research uh, studying the neural correlates of rhythm processing in adults and uh, it's not my objective to go, to go through this literature, but briefly, because we will, we will uh, do the same, uh, we will pose the same questions in premature neonates. Briefly, I would like to know. That, I, I would like to mention that um, studies in adults have shown that the adults' brain have the capacity to entrain to regular uh, patterns of sounds. For example, as shown by Nozaradan, when presented by with a repetitive auditory stimulation. The, the adult's brain entrain to the frequency of the beat, meaning uh, the repetition rate of the auditory events and create a neural response corresponding to the repetition rate of, 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 the, of the auditory events. But not only because uh, the brain, the adult's brain is capable of grouping uh, these auditory events either by, for example, accents present in the, in the events or the intervals that are present in the events, or even by imagining uh, the grouping of the events together. For example, when the adults uh, imagine a grouping of two, the neural response gives a um, give the response at the frequency corresponding to the grouping of two. When they imagine grouping of three, the, the, the brain gives a response co corresponding to the frequency of grouping uh, uh, of three events. And this is achieved as shown by Grant, for example, um, in a um, functional network consisting of both cortical and subcortical sources. So the adult's brain can entrain to regular patterns but uh, it can also detect violation from the regularities. For example, as we did recently, as we shown recently, when we have a rhythmic structure, for example, a simple rhythmic structure, for example, a tone, uh, a long tone followed by two, uh, two short tones, and then we have uh, the subjects listening to this pattern repeatedly, and then we have sudden violation from this simple rhythmic structure by having, for example, the last chord arriving earlier than expected, the brain gives a neural response. And we, when we look at the ERPs, we see that from the onset of the violation, we see a mismatch negativity corresponding to the uh, detection of the violation from the regular pattern, followed by a uh, positive component, both over the frontocentral region of the brain and uh, interestingly, when we have smaller violations, for example, instead of having the last 
court arriving earlier than expected, we remove the last court and, and hence we create a smaller violation in the rhythmic structure. We have smaller mismatch negativity followed with, and there is no uh, positive component over the frontal cortex, frontal central cortex. And, uh, but this is, this is already shown, I mean, the mismatch response to the rhythm violations in adults. But what is interesting is that we studied the underlying oscillatory activity and we found that, okay, in the time of the mismatch response, the mismatch negativity, the negative component that we saw here, we have the oscillatory activity over the theta range, which is, uh, not, some, which is not something new. It has already been reported in the ERP studies, but interestingly, when we have a large violation and we have the P3 component over the left frontal areas, we see high frequency activities at the timing of the P3, P3A component for, deviate, for uh, neural response to rhythm deviations. And in this context, uh, we, uh, we related this high frequency oscillatory, late high frequency oscillatory activity over the frontal central cortex um to uh, the update of the neural model of the of the temporal regularities present in the rhythmic sequences and we related this to the um to the to the to in the context of predictive coding and processing of uh, temporal regularities in the brain because when we are exposed to temporal regularities in a rhythmic sequence the brain is constantly predicting the events about, uh, for example, when, when we are talking about temporal regularities, the brain is constantly creating predictions about when the, the coming uh, event uh, will arrive. And uh, once this, and so uh, this is a model that it is, it is a very simplified model that I um, drew based on the, on the model proposed by Friston in predictive coding. Uh, so we are, there are connections that are not shown, the, the inhibitory connections, the lateral connections are not shown, but it's a very simplified model to explain what I wanted to say for, for predictive coding. When the brain is exposed to the rhythmic regularities, but not only, it's pres it, this is for processing, term, predictive processing of other types of regularities, for example, the statistical regularities. Uh, when the brain is exposed to uh, regular patterns, it's constantly predicting uh, uh, the upcoming events and it's constantly creating predictions. These predictions are created in the higher levels of the hierarchy, in the cortical hierarchy, and are fed back to the sensory areas. And it's contrasted to the sensory input, which is the auditory input in our case. And once we have a, a, an auditory event which violates the predictions, then the prediction error is created and this prediction error is fed forward in, from the forward connections to revise the prediction, uh, uh, the prediction model, the predictive model of the temporal regularities. So being exposed to rhythm, uh, br the brain is learning from the temporal regularities. But going back a lot back in the course of development from the adults to the premature neonates, we know that, uh, and, and, and fetus, we know that the fetus, uh, for, for the fetus, uh, hearing is functional from 25 weeks gestational age. And from this period uh, on, the fetus is constantly exposed to rhythmic patterns. It's constantly hearing the rhythmic patterns. It's, exposed to the rhythmic, for example, sounds of the mother's heartbeat, to the mother's respiration, but not only because uh, it's, uh, the fetus is also exposed to the auditory uh, environment. Uh, of course, the sound is filtered, so uh, the frequency content of the sound is distorted, but the rhythmic information uh, is uh, kept intact. So from very early in the course of development, the fetus is uh, learning from rhythmic patterns. But this is not the case for, uh, for the premature born uh, infants because uh, instead of being exposed to, this, to all these temporal, auditory temporal information, the fetus is, uh, uh, excuse me, the premature neonates are exposed to the uh, NICU auditory environment. So they are deprived of these um, uh, rhythmic patterns, rhythmic auditory patterns, and instead they're hearing uh, the uh, what is present in the NICU. And this 
might cause suboptimal auditory development in premature neonates. In fact, uh, our hypothesis uh, for addressing rhythm perception in premature neonates is that can we, uh, if the question is, can we uh, use uh, the neural response, uh, the very early neural response in premature neonates as a biomarker or an indicator of auditory temporal processing and development of auditory temporal processing at, uh, at this age, very early in the course of development. So if we take, for example, uh, this is the, hy the hypothesis, if we take, for example, the x-axis and we have lack of neural response to rhythmic structures and uh, auditory rhythm, from, to, from this to a well-formed neural response to rhythm, is it possible, probably, it is possible probably that uh, the population that will have a normal development uh, for auditory processing and specifically auditory temporal processing, we have a we have um, a response different from uh, the population who are in risk of uh, neurodevelopmental disorders and disorders specifically related to auditory temporal processing. So the idea is uh, is to to characterize because I mean this is the hypothesis, but the first step is to characterize the neural response and characterize the role of prematurity in uh, creating the response to rhythmic auditory patterns. And then to see if this, if this difference really exists between, um, between different populations of premature born neonates. So if this is the case, then the ultimate objective would be to propose early interventions in the NICU to enhance and also to improve auditory temporal processing, but this will be uh, this will be the ultimate objective. And the first step would be first to characterize the neural response to uh, auditory temporal patterns and rhythmic patterns. So, for this first step of the research, we posed uh, two questions. First. As we see in adults, can the premature neonates entrain to a rhythm or to a rhythmic pattern? And if this is the case, uh, uh, it happens at exactly what level? Is it entrainment to beat or is the premature neonate uh, capable of, uh, gr uh, of, of grouping of the auditory events? And if so, what are the underlying mechanisms? The second question that we posed is that, is the premature neonate capable of detecting the violations from a regular rhythmic structure? And if so, what are the underlying mechanisms? In order to answer to the first question, and this is a collaboration with Laura Trainer from McMaster Institute for Music and the Mind uh, from Canada. In order to answer to the first question, we expose this uh, the sleeping premature neonates to auditory rhythmic patterns. We used um, an amb two, in fact, ambiguous rhythmic patterns, and uh, you have them uh, on the left of the slide. Uh, I will explain one and then we can generalize to the second. Uh, the rhythmic pattern is created by uh, um, sound and silences. Uh, so there is no accent uh, on, uh, on the sounds and uh, the frequency content of the sounds does not uh, do not change does not change from one uh, one sound to the other, and so we have this pattern: sound, silence, sound, 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 silence, with an uh, inter-event interval of 333 milliseconds. And this pattern is presented to the premature neonates repeatedly in uh, blocks of 38 and 36 seconds. So we have repetitive. Um, um, uh, presentation of either pattern uh, of either rhythm one, either rhythm two, and we see that okay, so we have a duration of 333 milliseconds, which uh, gives to the frequency of uh, which gives the frequency of three hertz, and then if we uh, if the premature neonate is capable of grouping these events, grouping of two, because this is an ambiguous rhythm, which uh, leads uh, as you see over the on the, sorry. On the, on the right here, 
this is the frequency content of this stimulation of this rhythmic pattern. We see the uh, beat frequency, the three hertz, and then grouping of uh, two, which is a, a duple meter, is corresponds to 1.5 hertz, and grouping of three corresponds to one hertz. So if the premature neonate uh, is capable of grouping the events in the neural response, we should have the neural response to 1.5 and one as it is the case in adults. And then for the second rhythm, the frequencies are different. So the group, the perceptual grouping is by, by two and by four. And we still have the frequency beat uh, of three hertz grouping of two events gives the frequency of 1.5 hertz and grouping of four events give the frequency of 70, uh, 0 0.75. So we presented these rhythmic patterns with silence intervals in between uh, 15 premature neonates between the between 29 and 34 weeks gestational age were recorded uh, with 50 repetitions of each block and uh, during this time a high resolution eg 128 electrode recordings uh, were carried out and then we analyzed the neural response to these rhythmic patterns. The problem is that when we are trying to address um, the entrainment to, to rhythmic patterns, we are dealing with low frequency oscillatory activities over a large time window. Uh, the problem with premature neonates is for the analysis of the EEG in premature neonates is the um, high amplitude bursts of activity followed by um, uh, interburst intervals. And these high bursts uh, can hide the response. And uh, if we analyze the data, considering these bursts of activity, we don't see the response. The problem is that when we are dealing with entrainment response, we cannot do what we do in ERP analysis, meaning rejecting the trials that, uh, that fall into these burst intervals. Because if we do so, then we will distort the low frequency oscillatory activity over the large time windows of 30, for example, something uh, seconds. So what we did, we tried to, using the high resolution aspect of the EEG, we tried to model and reduce uh, the amplitude of, uh, of these burst periods to be able to characterize the entrainment to auditory rhythm. And so we tried to uh, reduce this, uh, the amplitude of these bursts, bursts of activity by trying to, to model this activity based on the, um, on, on, the, uh, on the signals over the electrodes where we don't have the bursts and based on the activities before and after the bursts. And after that, we performed a spectral analysis and normalization of the data. Interestingly, we saw that for both rhythmic patterns, we had, this is what you see here is the frequency tagging uh, results, and this is the grand average over all the electrodes over all the 15 subjects. We saw that um, the premature neonates, as early as the age that I mentioned, between 20, 29 and 34, are capable to entrain to the beat frequency. We see a clear three hertz response, which is significant, uh, which is significant uh, in our population, but not only. Interestingly, they're capable of grouping of the auditory events because we see for the first rhythm, uh, an uh, entrainment response to frequency of 1.5 hertz and one hertz, which correspond uh, respectively to a grouping of two and three events. And for rhythm two, we see the neural response corresponding to grouping of two and four, and the corresponding to frequencies of 1.5 and 0 0.75 hertz. Uh, and we see that, for example, the, one, the frequencies are different over the, uh, over the different blocks corresponding to different rhythms. So we see that clearly the premature neonates in train to both beat and meter frequencies uh, which was already reported at one year old. And uh, at one year old, as was done by Cyril Lee and Laurel Trainer in 2016, uh, the entrainment response was observed in infants. And it, we, they, they saw that uh, the amplitude of the response um, is different with, in children with parents with musical background from children without any uh, 
familiar uh, without any musical background in the family. But the fact that we have this response in premature neonates in the NICU born between 29 and 34 weeks um, gives, uh, gives uh, the hypothesis that probably, okay, there are innate factors, there are uh, probably uh, um, characteristics of the response that are gen of, the, of the neural response that are genetically coded, but this also uh, leads to the question of the role of premature birth on this process and the evolution uh, of uh, the development of cortical processing and the neural response from this er this er this age this early age to 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 the age of for example one year when we see clear response and we see the impact of learning on 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 the response characteristics so what are we uh, what we are doing next after finding the response we are trying to uh, address the underlying functional connectivity by performing source analysis and uh, addressing these neural responses uh, in the source space but the results are not yet ready to be reported so we have uh, the we have the neural response uh, to entrainment to a rhythmic structure in premature neonates and we see that okay it is at the beat level but it's also present at the grouping uh, at the level of grouping of the auditory events so if the premature neonates can entrain to a rhythmic uh, structure are they is it is he she capable of detecting the violations from a regular rhythmic structure and if so what are the underlying mechanisms to uh, answer this question, uh, we uh, designed another experiment uh, during which 19 healthy uh, premature neonates at the age of 30 to 34 weeks gestational age were exposed to a simple, uh, simple rhythm, a simple rhythm in a 2-4 meter as we used for the adults. We, we pre I presented the results earlier. Uh, again, we have a simple rhythmic structure, a long chord followed by two, um, two, two short chords. And then the, the neonate, as we see here, is, uh, is exposed to this rhythmic pattern repetitively, repeatedly. And then suddenly we have a deviation from the, this uh, rhythmic pattern by the last chord arriving earlier than expected. So we have a violation of the rhythmic structure uh, and uh, then, uh, you know, uh, but I forgot to say that in order to mark the beat and the uh, reinforce meter, we also had an accent as shown in the image. So the premature neonate uh, was exposed to, the, to this rhythmic structure in the oddball paradigm as uh, shown in the image. And then simultaneously, we had a high resolution EEG recording, 128 EEG recording uh, during the process. And then we analyzed, we tried to characterize the neural response and analyze the neural response. Uh, first, uh, what we see here is the ERP response of the premature neonates uh, to the deviation from the rhythmic structure. Zero is set at the onset of the deviation, and we see that uh, uh, around about 200 milliseconds um, after the onset of the deviation, we see the neural response, which is different for the deviant compared to the control case, and so and the difference is significant, is significant uh, over this, uh, this, this window shown here. And then this is followed by another response with a different polarity for the deviant, and we see the change in the polarity for the, for the neural response to the deviant condition. And here we see the topo plot of the, of the neural response over the first and the second window corresponding to the two significant time windows of the neural response to rhythm deviations. So this is the this is the ERP response to the uh, to rhythm deviation based on the res response. So we know that the premature neonate uh, creates a mismatch response. We say mismatch response because as we see here, the polarity of the response is positive 
whereas it was negative for the adults in the slides shown earlier. So the premature neonate uh, creates a mismatch response to the deviation from a regular rhythmic structure. Uh, but the second question that we have to respond to is related to the underlying mechanisms uh, in creation of these uh, neural responses. So uh, in order to address the underlying neural mechanisms, uh, we used dynamic uh, causal modeling. Dynamic, I, I'm not going to go through the theoretical details of dynamic causal modeling, but briefly, uh, dynamic causal modeling uh, make inferences about the effective connectivity between neural sources defined uh, a priori uh, and the modulation of the connections between these sources as uh, during the respond to, to, to the patterns or by the task that are presented, by the task that is presented. What is happening in dynamic causal modeling is that uh, well, this, this, this concept was first introduced by Friston, but then it was uh, used for uh, explaining the effective connectivity under ERP responses by David, but by David for the first time. So uh, briefly, what happens is that uh, in dynamic causal modeling, we assume sources, specific sources uh, corresponding to the to the ERP response. And the, these sources are responsible for creating the neural response to, to the stimuli. And uh, we have the connections between these sources and we have the sensory input, in our case, the auditory input. And then we have um, a range of uh, differential equations which explain the uh, temporal dynamic relationship between the sources. So these we have the state equations and we have the input as well. And then we have the model parameters which characterize the connectivity pattern between these sources. Then uh, the response of the sources are projected to the sensory space using forward modeling. And then what happens is that during a uh, procedure of expectation maximization constantly, uh, uh, repetitively, uh, DCM calculates the model response, then it compares the model response and try and tries to improve uh, the model response, but if possible, by optimization of the model parameters. And at the end, we have the posterior probability of uh, the model parameters, which refers to the connectivity pattern between sources, and then we have the model evidence uh, for each model, and then we have a winning model. So we use this concept because um, this model has been used previously to explain uh, the connectivity, the effective connectivity underlying the mismatch response, the mismatch negativity, to be more precise, in adults. Uh, Specifically, uh, considering the ventral pathway for uh, for uh, for analyzing the mismatch response and the uh, and the uh, specifically auditory information, because at the time of the detection of the deviant uh, activity was observed specifically over left and right superior temporal gyruses, and then uh, the right inferior frontal gyrus. Previously, uh, Garrido, Philips, Chenou, and other researchers have used um, dynamic causal modeling to explain uh, the effective connectivity underlying the mismatch response shown in the figure above. And they showed that, for example, considering a network of, uh, uh, of the primary auditory cortex of the STGs, uh, superior temporal gyruses over the left and right cortex, cortices, and also the right IFG, we can explain the neural response and, and, and uh, the effective connectivity underlying uh, the neural response to frequency deviation, to duration deviation, which is related to the temporal regularities of the events, and also the omission of the tones. Of course, the underlying effective connectivity differed for different types of neural processes. So we took the idea 
of DCM to, uh, to explain the effective connectivity underlying the mismatch response. Because, I mean, the reason that we did, uh, we had uh, this choice is that we know that the ventral pathway is already functional and in uh, previous work done and presented uh, before today by Mahdi, we see uh, the activity over the frontal cortex in the course of the response to uh, hear syllab and voice changes. So we know that, I mean, during the predictive coding, in, even in premature neonates, the frontal cortex, cortex is activated. So what we did in parallel, in, in um, considering uh, the specifically, for example, the, the results and the model proposed by Garrido, we, uh, we used the MRI image of uh, a premature neonate, and then we selected uh, the, the regions of interest, which were the primary auditory cortex, A1, the SDGs, and IFGs. And then uh, considering that we have the mismatch response for in the premature neonates, as presented in the previous slide, we tried to find the underlying effective connectivity for this mismatch response. So uh, our question uh, was that, uh, was that is the neural processing of the mismatch response in premature neonates limited to the uh, higher, to the, sorry, lower levels of the cortical hierarchy, or does it engage the higher levels of the hierarchy? And if so, is it happening through only forward message transfer, forward communication, or does it consist of a backward message transfer in the course of the mismatch response? So what we did, we had these sources, and then we uh, considered different models. We had um, two models with only the primary auditory cortices involved, and then we had models which included the SDGs, um, and then we had uh, the IFG, but only with forward connection, no backward connection from the IFG to the SDG. Uh, and then we considered uh, the involvement of right and left uh, uh, cortices, the IFGs specifically, with again and without uh, backward connections. And then we had uh, the full model, meaning uh, full uh, forward and backward connections and uh, the connections over the two hemispheres. And then we performed uh, the DCM analysis uh, using the forward model previously developed in the lab uh, for the premature neonates, which, uh, which is different from that of adults, uh, obviously, and which consider the uh, the, the structural data of the premature neonates. So using this model, we saw that for the time window corresponding to the mismatch shown uh, in, the, uh, in the red rectangle in the image, uh, the, the, the winning model is the model which uh, has the right IFG and it has uh, both the forward and backward connections. So in the, uh, in the time course of the mismatch response, mismatch response of in premature neonates, uh, we have both bottom up and top down message transfer, which, uh, which, uh, which is a dialogue that uh, explains away the mismatch response and the neural uh, mechanisms underlying the creation of the mismatch response. And when we look, we consider the family uh, comparisons, the models without uh, the models without the involvement of the frontal cortex, the models only with forward connection, and the model with forward and backward connections, we see very strong evidence with the models uh, with forward and backward connections, suggesting that. In fact, the processing of the mismatch response is not limited, even in the premature neonates, to the lower levels of the cortical hierarchy, and it involves in the frontal cortex in a um, bottom-up and top-down string. 
there are limitations. I mean, I have to say that there are limitations to this study because we are using DCM uh, developed for the adults, but we know that the neural dynamics in premature neonates are, is not exact, is not the same as in adults, for example. We know that the laminar structure is developing. We know that long associative pathways uh, undergo uh, intense development. And we know that this period of late prematurity is marked by significant dendrite differentiation and synaptogenesis as suggested by Costa Rica. And also, uh, generalizing from the uh, generalizing from the animal studies, we know that uh, the inhibitory gamma is under development, and it's and also uh, it's switched from excitate from uh, let's uh, from depolarization to hyperpolarization uh, uh, is also under development. Um, that being said. Yeah. So, I mean, uh, considering the limitations, uh, we have to treat the presented results with caution. But that being said, we know that the ventral pathway is functional and the long distance connections already exist. And postmortem studies show the presence of, for example, superficial and uh, deep pyramidal cells. So, uh, a, a simplified model as proposed for uh, explaining the ERP response based on effective connectivity can be used uh, to explain the mismatch response, although the next step uh, would be to uh, study the, the variations and the changes in the uh, effective connectivity as a result of uh, variations in the parameters probably related to the premature uh, structural uh, pr premature structure of, of, of the auditory system and the cortical networks. So after the characterization of the neural response, the next step would be uh, to consider, because we are using until now a simple rhythmic structure, but because we are we are interested in the predictive coding process, the idea is to use more complex structures and see, uh, in fact, what aspect of the neural response to different complexity in the temporal structures are uh, evolved in the course of development or more uh, affect or more affected or modulated by premature birth, and the impact uh, and uh, hence to address the impact of prematurity. Well, that's it. Uh, thank you for your attention. And uh, if you have questions, I would be happy to respond to your questions.